story of Cinderella. So she's often been criticized by modern day feminists, and just people in general, about being too weak minded and too dependent. She didn't know how to speak out against her captors, and she married a prince who she only knew for just one night. However, I do personally believe that her inner strength is often overlooked by people. I will justify myself later, but firstly, I'd like to start off by saying that I believe that people do tend to forget that society changes over time, and that society wasn't particularly easy to navigate during Cinderella's time. She was an orphan who had to tolerate her stepmother and to tolerate the way she was being treated, because she knew that she would have nowhere else to go if she did disobey. A woman as young as her wouldn't be able to live all by herself in the society she grew up in. So I don't see Cinderella as being a kind damsel whose entire existence circulated around being kind to people. She was still a sarcastic witness, and she was still a chaser of stepmother's cataway with the stick. She was just like one of us. She was someone who hated her circumstances, who sympathized with people who were treated exactly like her. What I see to be a big sign for inner strength was while she could easily have become cold and sullen and grumpy, she didn't, and she held on to some of her values, such as remaining apathetic. Therefore, I don't see Cinderella as being weak minded for marrying the prince. She knew that she would be better off living in a palace than being abused by her stepfather. Instead, I believe that a better representation of weak minded people would be her stepsisters, who simply allowed themselves to believe in whatever they were told to believe in. They were cruel to Cinderella because their mother was cruel to her. And they smoothed over the prince because their mother told them to. So it wasn't necessarily their fault, it's just that they were only ever exposed to that sort of world, and they didn't know how else to cope. They didn't know what they believed in, and they didn't value certain traits like Cinderella did, like imagination, and wit, and empathy. Cinderella, on the other hand, knew that she couldn't lose sight of herself, despite everyone else she knew pressuring her to do so. She had a vision and a desire of her own. So I like to think of us human beings as a vulnerable version of Cinderella, surrounded by society, expectations, and values that are forcing us into becoming dull and colorless. We know that we have aspirations, but we allow other people to tell us what to be. We allow ourselves to get caught up in our own world, and most especially, we don't know what we believe in. However, straight away from Cinderella for a moment, I came across an article a few weeks ago which was on Jean Piaget's theory. He was a Swiss psychologist, by the way. So he suggested that there are multiple stages to our development, which was also quite closely linked with another article I read on an American psychologist, Lawrence Kohlberg, and his theory on the different stages of our moral development. So I'll summarize these various different aspects. Initially, we start off as beings that orientate ourselves by looking at our surroundings and by judging what we believe to be inherently good or bad simply based off what feels good or what is familiar in our environment. Naturally, once we gain a better understanding of language and social interaction, we begin to navigate the world by asking people questions and they respond by telling us what they believe to be right or wrong. Of course, eventually, we all reach a stage in life where we build up our portfolio of experiences and use it to comprehend other people's perspectives as well as being able to make cause and effect connections about the world around us. So what I see here is that our development as human beings is very strongly rooted in the sense of social interaction, as well as how that defines how we view the world and what our values are. I believe that the most appropriate umbrella term for this would be culture. And definitely, where culture is concerned, I see that there is an abundance of values directed at hurting people who display certain prejudices as well as practices and laws punishing people who disagree with these values. I believe that the sense of societal judgment is well summarized in the book of Demian or Herman Hessel. So the story is about a boy named Sinclair who grows up in World War I during, uh, in Germany, and she grows up in this world full of societal expectations and values which he is confronted by. So he describes this sense of judgment as um, and he says these impulses always came from this other world and were accompanied by fear, constraint, and a bad conscience. So, momentarily returning back to Lawrence Colbert's stages of moral development, we see that we're told what's right and what's wrong in relation to our surroundings as children, and we just deem it as being true. So, 
So I tell you, this part is interrogating a glimpse of the world without the sense of morality and without guidance from his parents. And she was scared. Scared because it was unfamiliar and because he was constantly told that it was wrong. So, <coughs> that's true. What Sunder said was indeed true. That we often feel frustrated by what we believe to be unfamiliar. Because all throughout our childhood, which is when we gain an understanding of the world around us, we develop an emotional connection with the world, and it just becomes a part of what we would consider to be rational. So without being raised in Cinderella society, which was during the 17th century, seen as how the most popular version of Cinderella was written by Charles Perrault, who was a French author in 1697, I would have been told that I would have been told that women who wanted to live their lives independently were sinners. So I definitely wouldn't have sympathized with Cinderella if she'd gone running up to me, begging for accommodation because she'd been disinherited by her family. I would have slammed the door in her face, not because I'm a cruel person, but because I would have been told that it wasn't right for a woman to want to be independent. So of course, seeing as how we are living in the 21st century in a developed society, we may now consider this to be unreasonable, seeing as how during Cinderella's time, women were not granted a lot of the rights in which men were granted, such as even the most trivial of things, such as the right to vote, or even the right to use oil paints. However, if we were to take a look at this in retrospect, it wasn't completely unreasonable. This was during a period of time prior to industrialization, when education was scarce and no one lived for long. So women had to run the household as it was considered much too strenuous for them to clothe fields all day long. And in addition, it was also just assumed that they should know how to best care for the children, since they were biologically gifted with that ability. And the statement, many people would argue, isn't a very rational, nor truthful one, but that's the thing. As much as we're encouraged to think so, our beliefs and our culture don't revolve around being rational. It's a very emotional response in which we have to say about situations like these. For instance, I live in the 21st century, where I have so much exposure to platforms such as the mainstream media in the form of YouTube, for instance, or Instagram, which proves to be the biggest factor in deciding my beliefs, culture, and what I believe to be moral or immoral. But what I see, as a girl especially, is that the media makes us feel inferior. So in which the, me the way in which the media earns to me, the way in which advertisers earn your profit is by making us feel as if we are lacking and what we are selling will solve all our problems. So we wouldn't turn towards looking up certain idols like singers or models unless we feel as if we are lacking in beauty, talent, or in personality. And yes, although I didn't grow up in Cinderella society and I am privileged to have gotten an education and I'm not barred from living my life to the fullest just because of my gender, that doesn't mean that I'm immune to being affected by societal expectations. For instance, I'm often met with female singers who slap feminist slogans in my face that sing about toxic relationships and boys connecting. And I'm told that these are the people who I should be looking up to. So there's me from five months ago, scrolling through the Spotify charts, while I'm complaining to one of my classmates about how all the trending songs seem to be conveying socially unacceptable messages. And she says something to me that really did take me aback for a moment. She said, why do you dislike everything? And that was my epiphany. I didn't feel like I was any better than people living in the 17th century who would curse at independent women for having feelings. I didn't even feel like I could rationally explain my burning dislike towards these female figures in particular, whom I'm told I must look up to. And the excuse I've always used was, what you're doing isn't just socially acceptable, it's not okay to go out on camera while wearing skirts that are only an inch long and say that that's me of feminism or that's me of loving myself. But when you're always only opinion in statements and question, would I question do that if I had the opportunity to do so? The answer was yes, I would. I don't believe that I'm a bad person for thinking this way. I just see it as being proof that I'm easily swayed by other people's opinions, and the way how the media is using these opinions to model the people who do these boring neighbors to look up to and to idolize. So, as Leo Tolstoy puts it, oh, sorry. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing itself. So, what I see here is 
that just because I may disagree with some forms of societal judgments, such as Ariana Grande telling me that it's okay for me to ask someone to break up with his girlfriend, for instance, that doesn't necessarily mean that society is just going to change for me. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I legitimately want society to condone this sort of behavior. So when we're told that we are lacking and that when we feel that as we are lacking, we're then told that we're meant to worship people who reflect these supposed qualities. But in this situation, I see that I could decide to worship them or I could decide to hate on them because they have something which I don't have. Something which may not necessarily appeal to my sense of logos, but which most definitely does appeal to my sense of emotions. So we, as people, and we, as consumers, are targeted emotionally. Of course, I'm not making this speech because I'm perfect. I personally said stupid things and I've personally done stupid things, just like anyone else in this room has. I'm making this speech as a reminder to, as a reminder to myself, just as much as I want it to be your with me, that we often need to think before we act. Not necessarily because we should morally be nice to people, but just to avoid living life hatred towards ourselves and spite towards everyone else. It just saves us all that time and effort when we can just be happier with our lives. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is to identify the root cause of your beliefs. The reason behind why you live your life the way you do, so that you can define it, you can also define which one of your values or your opinions are worth holding on to. Okay. So I think this means that it's fine for us to look up to certain people, or it's fine to, for us to hold on to certain values. But understanding whether we legitimately side with these opinions in which we hold brings us a step closer to legitimately understanding what exactly our beliefs are for us. And secondly, abolishing the doubts which come with just allowing the values we say we do or do not conform to dictate the way we allow ourselves to be influenced emotionally or the way we view ourselves. And I believe that the way in which we can become one step closer to this sort of mindset is to ask yourself one final question. How can I be more like Sinatra? Thank you.